welcome to today's webinar. My name is Dwayne Butcher of Lean Frontiers, and I have the privilege of kicking things off today. Uh, we're pleased to bring uh, today a webinar in a partnership with our friends at the TWI Institute. You can also see on the screen our presenters for today, who I'll introduce uh, momentarily. Uh, today's webinar is a lead up to the virtual Lean Coaching Summit, which one of our facilitators, Patrick Grout, uh, will be keynoting. Uh, that summit happens July 27th through the 31st. You can learn more about that summit by visiting leanfrontiers.com slash summits. Uh, if you, um, point, few points of logistics here before we get started. Uh, today's short presentation is being recorded. Uh, you can look for an email shortly after the session ends with a link to the recording. And please do share this with others in your organization. A copy of today's presentation is available in the GoToWebinar toolbar off to the right side of your screen. So you can feel free to hunt for that and download the PowerPoint deck. And we will be fielding questions. So if you have questions, feel free to submit those on the GoToWebinar toolbar. We have had a number of questions already submitted. We'll get to as many questions as we can. So with that said, let me introduce our panelists for the day. Uh, first up, we have Patrick Graup, who is one of the principals of the TWI Institute based out of San Diego, certainly one of the most experienced TWI practitioners uh, on the planet, and that is not hyperbole. Uh, we also have Dave Hyam, who is VP of Metal Fabrication at the Boeing Company. And finally, we have Kirk Wardell, who is past president of more court uh, switches. You'll get to know each of these gentlemen more as we continue on. So for now, Patrick, I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to you and let you guys have a chat. Okay, so thank you very much, Dwayne, and thank you in the audience uh, for everyone attending our uh, presentation. Um, you know, I'm gonna be the uh, moderator uh, for our discussions today because we're here to um, hear from uh, two of my old friends and. Uh, two gentlemen, that it's just my distinct pleasure and honor to be uh, sharing the screen with you today. Uh, Dave Heim and Kirk Wardell, who I've worked with uh, both of these gentlemen over many, many years uh, on the TWI programs and uh, uh, really um, look to them with uh, great experience. And uh, they've taught me a lot about how, you know, we can uh, implement TWI in the bigger um, field. Now, Dave uh, is, works with Boeing and, you know, of course, everyone's familiar with Boeing, uh, one of the biggest uh, corporations in the world. So Dave's going to tell us about his experiences. Um, but uh, Kirk, Kirk work, works for a, a medium sized company called Marquardt uh, Switches. Kirk, do you want to just take a minute to tell everybody what Marquardt does so that we get a little more familiar with what that is? My pleasure. Good afternoon, everyone. Yeah, Marquardt's one of those companies that most people have never heard of, but most people interact with on a daily basis. And the reason for that is, is that we make a lot of automotive parts across the globe. We're in uh, every OEM except for one across the globe. And we do things uh, like start your car, any of the buttons inside the cabin of the vehicle. So anything you can press a button inside the cabin of the car, truck, what have you, and control functionality Marquardt makes products for. And uh, in the US, GM and Chrysler or FCA are top brands with some new business with Ford, but across the globe, um, Mercedes, BMW, VW, Audi, and so forth. So almost every manufacturer of automobiles has Marquardt switch products in it. Okay, well, great to have you with us, uh, Kirk, and we'll look forward to hearing about that. So today, uh, our topic, um, and we're going to hear from these two distinguished gentlemen, is frontline strategies for the uh, post-pandemic um, recovery. As companies start to come out, they're going to give us their experiences. Um, but before we start, if I could just take a few minutes to kind of set the stage here, um, tell you a little bit about myself and, and, and how I got to know these two gentlemen. Um, I, many in the audience, I'm sure you're familiar with TWI, training within industry, and if, if so, you'll know the history of our TWI programs that we run at the TWI Institute. It was programs that started during the war, um, World War II, you know, when all the men, experienced men, went off to fight the war and uh, replaced by, uh, you know, new people, many women coming into the workforce for, many, for the first time. Remember, this is in the 1940s. I think that was a, certainly the situation at Boeing up in Seattle when they were making the B-17 bombers. Uh, but the key thing for our topic today is that, 
you know, this was a very new and challenging situation. And, and uh, the, we found that we had to deal with this crisis, the war, uh, uh, bringing new people into a very changing environment. And that's where TWI was born. And here we are today with a very a challenging environment, which is, of course, the, um, the COVID-19 pandemic. And uh, we're finding that TWI helps us, you know, as it helped us in World War II, it's also helping in this moment of crisis. You know, I myself, I learned TWI back in the early 80s uh, when I got out of college and went to Japan. I worked for Sanyo. But if, very famously, um, TWI was embraced by Toyota in the early 1950s and really became a staple of what we today call the Toyota Production System, or Lean. It was brought into Toyota by uh, the founder of Toyota Production System, Taiichi Ono. But I'd like to say that, you know, um, all the Japanese companies use TWI, not just uh, uh, Toyota, uh, which is very famous for that. Uh, it's kind of the benchmark for all of you lean practitioners out there. Uh, but all Japanese manufacturers, both large and small, you know, embraced TWI. And it really became the foundations of what we today call lean. And then back in around 2002, uh, when I first met Kurt around those days, uh, we were starting to reintroduce TWI back into the um, American industries. and and now we have people doing TWI all over the world. And so we can really say that, uh, you know, why does TWI work in these moments of crisis? And I think the key, and we'll hear from our presenters today, I think the, the theme will be that it's really about the human element, you know, of, of TWI. TWI really works on building strong relationships um, and guiding people to bring out their best performance in a time of crisis. And this is something that we can really look forward, forward to, you know, um, as we go through these challenging um, times. In fact, there's a recent survey um, by the uh, National Association of Manufacturing. You can see the results there. It said 78% of leaders really expect, um, you know, the COVID-19 pandemic to have a severe financial impact, you know, on their businesses and over, a little over half of them anticipate some change in their operations. So this is something that we're all going to have to deal with. And, um, you know, TWI um, really can, uh, um, help uh, do that. So just like um, back in the wartime era, you know, we could do it then and we can do it again. So these are some results you see of, of TWI, um, you know, as it goes, as uh, it's being practiced um, today. All right, so I'm gonna turn off my slides. Okay, everybody see our, our pictures and we'll start into our uh, program. So um, what we'd like to do is uh, hear from uh, Dave and Kirk about their experiences. So kind of to start off our discussion, um, uh, I'd like to ask the uh, the panelists, uh, you know, maybe kind of set the stage for our discussion today, and you know, what were the um, they can explain, maybe describe a little bit about what the situation was, you know, at Boeing and at Marquardt when the pandemic hit. Um, tell us a little bit about, you know, what were those challenges and what were the crises that they uh, initially encountered. Dave, do you want to start and tell us a little bit of what it looked like at Boeing when the when the COVID nineteen came down on you? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Pat, and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, yeah, at Boeing, uh, of course, we're we've got sites all over the U.S., around the world, and a global supply chain. But if we just back up into about the middle of March, um, many of you may remember seeing in the news that Seattle was kind of the uh, the initial outbreak of COVID in the U.S. It was in Seattle, where we have a lot of operations in Boeing and. Things were happening very fast. You know, uh, certain governors, the state of Washington uh, governor implemented a stay at home order. And you know, this was really happening between like a Friday and a Monday. Very quickly, the environment was changing. And, and of course, it was a changing around our company in different ways at multiple sites. And then staying connected with our supply chain, we just found ourselves in a situation that required us to quickly understand and and so it was it was a dynamic time to say the least uh, trying to make sense of what was going on so that was sort of how it started for us pat back in in march okay um what what were some of the big pitfalls dave that you faced right up front i mean obviously stopping production no one's coming in but I'm sure in terms of the business, there were some real challenges that, that, you, that you were confronted with. Yeah, I mean, certainly um, right away, just trying to understand how can we how can we safely operate? What would our customers need from us? You know, the airlines, as you probably know, are highly impacted by things like this. And 
worries about traveling. It, it essentially shut off overnight. You know, travel right. did. Uh, we began to enter, you know, speak with our customers about what, you know, what does this look like? How do we begin to understand how we should operate uh, over the next several months? And so the, I, I think there was that period of time just trying to digest, you know, not only the business impact, but also the personal impact, given there was a lot of fear amongst everyone, you know, work-wise, family-wise, uh, just a lot of anxiety happening all at the same time. Yeah, yeah, we remember those days. Seems like a long time ago. <laughs> okay. Yeah, it does, yeah. Just a few months ago. All right, how about you, Kirk? What was the situation? You set the stage for us there. What was the situation there for Marquardt? Yeah, for us, we have uh, 20 locations across the globe. Two of them are in China. And so we saw the wave right when it first started in China and then making its way through Europe as it was heading to the U.S. And, uh, you know, I'll never forget being on three times a week calls with the rest of the global leaders and just trying to uh, understand what's going on and, and how do we need to react. And as Dave said, how do we keep people safe? What are the customer expectations? The customers were up and down about what they wanted and, and whether or not they were going to be open themselves. Um, we were also trying to understand and um, take the lead from China early on as to what they were doing, how they were doing it. So we're following all of this stuff and trying to figure out what was going to be the impact in the U.S. And then it hit the U.S. And then, you know, our, our governor was fairly famous across the country at taking a pretty hard line stance. Yeah, you so, might want to mention you're in New York State. I don't know. Yeah, if that's right. I'm in upstate New York near Syracuse, New York. And, you know, for us upstaters, we call ourselves, uh, you know, a lot of people think New York City is in the center of the state and everything else is a suburb, but they're really kind of two distinct <clears throat> New Yorks, right? There's New York City and then there's the rest of New York. And so we're looking at what's going on in, in New York City and following uh, the governor's uh, daily press releases and also trying to understand even if our customers want us to do something, what are we going to be allowed to do? And that, you know, of course, culminated right into a complete shutdown of the state. And then you had to be uh, essential business to and, and achieve that status to open up. I think with other states, of course. Uh, but just working through that whole process and, and, and trying to understand what do we do and how do we do it? And um, what are the expectations of our customers? It was a daily conversation. Uh, with our leadership team trying to figure out what to do. Well, that's a nice segue, uh, Kirk, for us, because uh, we want to talk then about uh, now that we've kind of set the stage and we kind of understand the situation uh, you guys ran into, but let's talk a little bit more then as we go um, into what you did. Um, what was the planning like, um, you know, as you, um, uh, as you kind of tried to deal with, you know, uh, um, the situation that was presented to you, as you guys just explained, you know, I'm sure there were some really daunting aspects in terms of contemplating how you get back on track, how do you reopen, and what was that planning process look like? I mean, even things as simple as I know during those days, I had a lot of, you know, of our clients, our TWI clients calling me and saying, gee, how do we, we want to do some training, but we have to do the social distancing, and how can I do TWI GI training when we have to be six feet apart? Because you know, the method says you have to put the person in the right position, like looking over their shoulder and breathing on their neck. And so how do we do that? So there were lots of, you know, just little issues that, you know, uh, people came up with even when they were able to go back to work. So maybe you could take a little time to tell us about what that planning process looked like and what were some of the issues that, uh, you know, uh, you had to, to overcome as you or had to, had to plan to overcome, you know, as you went through that planning process. So Dave, you want to take us through what uh, you guys uh, did at Boeing? Yeah, sure. And, you know, I guess to start with, you know, we're it's a large organization. We have uh, uh, crisis management processes that we implement for things that c could happen to us, whether it's a natural disaster. You know, we have those sorts of processes. So that was enacted right away. We have a mm -hmm. at the or at the enterprise level, a crisis mm -hmm. management working group uh, that formed and and really just around the clock began to digest the situation and understand uh, what what do we know what do we not know I, I think the first business move we made was to have 
the vast majority of our office workers become virtual. So uh, overnight, I mean, literally over a weekend, we moved about 60,000 employees from on-site locations to virtual work locations. And uh, it really taxed our uh, IT systems in doing that. Uh, our company responded well, and we became, I think, surprisingly pretty productive in our virtual environment. We still have, have that predominantly going on with our office workers. Uh, if you want, Pat, I can, I'd can. i like to just show a couple of slides here to just to tie it back to TWI and, and how we really were thinking about this, you know, and I just wanted to, to highlight job relations. You know, we, of course, practice all aspects of TWI and Boeing, but specifically here, with job relations, you know, I think this is really relevant uh, given this type of issue where people are fearful. Uh, there's a lot of stress on them, work-related or or home-related. Uh, we we really relied upon this skill to help us not only think through solutions but speak to our teams and you know get their opinions and feelings and really understand how we could create an environment. You know, our goal really was to create a work environment that they felt safe in. Uh, ideally, we would want them to come to work and feel more safe at work than they would be just out in the community. So that was our principle uh, at the time. Uh, we went to work on that, um, understanding the advice coming from you know the CDC and the local government on how we could begin to operate. Um, we had a three week shut down at our Seattle location while we implemented many of these new processes. And if you page down one, Pat, I can explain that in a little bit more on further around TWI. You know, job relations is so important to build trust with the team and, and have them feel confident in their leaders, you know. But beyond that, with job instruction and job method, you know, we were quickly pivoting and implementing new work methods, you know, to keep people distance. We were redesigning work in a way that it could be performed, uh, keeping, you know, at least six feet of space. Where we couldn't do that, we were understanding what kind of PPE was necessary, uh, personal protective equipment was necessary, given what we knew at the time. And so mm -hmm. this period of three weeks that we were shut down in Seattle, uh, we were uh, going through this process here that you see on the screen to really redesign our work and create an environment where our team can can be successful completing their work, but also feel safe and secure while they're at work. And uh, of course, you know our company has a lot of resources. We quickly implemented contract tracing processes and things you would see in a local government. We implemented inside the company as a way of managing any you know, um, positive cases and finding ways to quarantine people quickly and so on. So it, that was the primary approach we took at the time. And we have a question, Dave, that came in, uh, which kind of relates to what you're talking about. And and since you mentioned TWI and uh, it, the question, the, the, the questioner said, how does how was TWI effective in getting the employees to buy into these new work requirements? You know, obviously, the, there were changes that they weren't accustomed to. They were changing some patterns, especially, you know, as they're returning to work. Well, was that helpful? And, and, and could you give, maybe give us an example of that? Yeah, yeah, sure. You know, I just draw your attention to this chart on the right-hand side, you know, and I, this really resonates to me. It says people won't follow your instructions if they don't trust your intentions, you know. So I think foundationally, it's so important that we that we build trust with our teams so that they will trust our intentions. And, you know, no more important than in a situation like this where we're learning as we go, you know, so our team realizes that we're, we're learning how to deal with this in the moment. Uh, and that to me requires an abundance of trust, you know, that while we are solving problems, our team feels confident that we have their best interests in mind. And that's something we've built over time, you know, through using uh, the TWI skills. Uh, it doesn't happen immediately. It's an investment in building trust over a period of time. But that that helped us a lot. I 
I, you know, I think it's been key to our success to have been working on these skills for some time preceding this situation. Um, but, you know, specifically, I think it was just uh, being, uh, making sure our people were being heard, explaining what we know in the moment. And when we know more, we, we share more, we do more. It's that sort of a process, you know, and that's been continuing. So. Excellent. Okay. So, so that was the situation at Boeing and in the Seattle area. Now, Kirk, we'll turn it over to you. What, what did you guys do at Marquardt there in terms of planning and, you know, how you would get to reopen? Yeah, maybe you can show the slide I have there too, because it kind of tells the story of how it unfolded for us. So, you know, early on in, in January and February, you know, as the fear and confusion started in the U.S. and specifically in New York State, tied to New York City, uh, we led right up to a full shutdown. And the governor said nobody can go to work unless you're essential. And if you are essential, you can only work on the essential part of your business. So we started getting letters from customers almost immediately saying, we're an essential business here, essential supplier, we need you working. And that was great, sort of, but what did that mean? Uh, how much demand was there? How many parts did they want? How many shifts? How many people? So we were actually physically down for one week. And that's how long it took us to, and this is working through the weekends and long into the evenings, but that's how long it took us to get the letters, um, reach out to our local government, have them reach out to the state, uh, achieve the essential business status, and then put our initial plan. An initial plan really had to focus on a number of things. Uh, first and foremost was eh &S, so environment, health, and safety. And how were you going to get anybody back in the building and create a safe work environment? And then the second thing was, is what are we there to do? What parts do we actually physically need to build? What do the customers really want and what are they gonna actually take? So our, our production plan was all over the place as the customer demands changed pretty significantly, literally day by day. So we had to adjust um, our production plans we had to adjust our material flow. We had to reach out to our suppliers. We had to stay in constant contact with our customers. Was the truck even gonna to come to pick these parts up if we made them? So we put those plans together. And as Dave said, we focused a lot on communication and making sure people knew what we knew and that we were very open and honest about what we didn't know. And in the very beginning, People were petrified to come in the building, even though we narrowed down the scope of where you can enter the building. We were doing temperature checking. Uh, we we uh, asked a series of questions based on the CDC guidelines. We sanitized several times a day. We were doing all these things. We put up the plexiglass barriers between the stations. Uh, we spread out on the production lines the number of people that were on the production line. We reduced the number of people. And I want to jump in here and say that all of this was done with a significant focus on those center three bullet points. Ensure employee safety, maintain standard work, and ensure consistent quality. Because if we came back in and tried to do all these things and we lost control of the three most important guiding light principles, and then we would not have been successful. And the way we use TWI in this is, fortunately, as Dave said, we had laid the foundation long before the, the pandemic hit. If we hadn't have, we wouldn't have been able to do what we did. I gotta be quite honest about that. And so given the fact that we had a solid foundation in place and we had a high level of standardized work, and we were able to come back and cross train a number of people. And if you look in the center, um, of the graph there, you'll, you'll see develop safety policy and train, use alternate staffing numbers on each line and train, rotate production support staff and train. So everything was centered around making sure that we were training in a standardized approach. And that built up to that other bullet point you'll see there, it says automotive OEM on site for an audit. So at the end of May, all of this culminated into uh, the OEMs coming in our building, they were the first non-employee people in our building where they were coming in to audit to make sure that we were doing exactly what we we're supposed to do. So again, 
the underlying theme here is, is we had to adjust to the ever-changing uh, needs, demands, and information. Um, we had to stay focused on our standards. We used job instruction to help us do that. And that also brought a certain level of peace to people because it's something they knew, it's something they trusted, as Dave said, and it enabled us to focus on the task at hand and less on the crazy pandemic that was going on around us. And the umbrella for all of this was and is today uh, consistent communication. We had a daily meeting with the top leadership. We had weekly videos that we sent out through the Markware app to all employees. Our app active participation went from 35% to over 80%. So we use a number of different communication tools to get the messages out, to see the face, to, to help people feel more comfortable with what's going on. And then we followed it up with a survey to make sure people uh, received, were receiving the message as we had hoped they were, which they were, and that gave us impetus to go on further. So I'll cut it off there for now, but the bottom line is we've been at this 25% level up until June, and now with the OEMs ramping back up, uh, we're back at full production as of the first part of July. Now, whether or not we stay at full production will be determined whether or not all of the consumers out there buy one of the vehicles that have March our products in them. So we'll see what happens. <laughs> hey, one, uh, Kirk, if I could, uh, just uh, again, I'm trying to get, get some of uh, our participant. We have a question that came in and it kind of touched a little bit on that because maybe a little different from Boeing, although you can correct me on that, Dave, but at Marquardt, it sounds like you had really swinging production demands, right? Because of the effects of the, the market and so on. So the question is, how did you deal with those unstable and unpredictable demands? And, yeah, and how did TWI help you there? Yeah, that's a great question. So you heard part of it, right? We we throttled back some of the production lines where we needed some of the output, but not full output. So if we needed five people or seven people or whatever number of people on a production line at full production, we were throttling back to two or three people. And we had already developed these standards and systems. As Dave said, we are automotive, similar to the airlines. We have to have contingency plans for these kinds of things, and we did. And so we had standard work approaches for reduced number of people on the lines. And we were able to use job instruction to refresh people's memory on how to do that and to retrain them and to cross train them if they had been working at other lines and weren't working on those specific lines. Because again, we were taking a crew of 25% of normal and moving them throughout the, the production facility to different uh, jobs and different tasks. So again, that focus on standard work was absolutely critical to not then create a quality problem, which in automotive has extremely penalties associated with it. Um, and I would mention that our, our production plan, we had a almost a daily sales and operations planning meeting to review the EDI forecast coming in and then to share that with our suppliers as well to ensure that we could get the material into our plant. Because like most companies, just because there's a pandemic going on doesn't mean it's a free for all and you can add as much stock as you want and buy whatever you want at the time. So we had to really closely monitor that and balance our production and flow material um, accordingly. Now, one, one of the things that both of you mentioned, and I have a question, and if I have it, I'm guessing some of our viewers may have the same question, but you both mentioned you had kind of contingency plans and you know, and uh, some of our viewers may not be familiar with that, but Dave, could you just maybe just highlight one or two? What what were some of the things, what do you mean when you say contingency plan? What were some of the things that were there? Now, of course, standard work, you mentioned that we had standardized work, but is there anything else there that, you know, like you said, if we didn't have that contingency plan, we wouldn't have survived this? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, when I say contingency plan, we, we have a process, I'll call it, uh, to quickly react to a, a business condition or some sort of abnormal condition that arises. We have a process that we work on, a business continuity process, I'll call it, that we enact immediately, you know. So uh, we, we all, from a, like a standard work perspective, this business continuity, emergency response team is kind of the terms we use inside Boeing. Those activated immediately, and many of us have roles to play 
in an emergency response situation. And uh, we're, you know, we're trained on that. It's part of our standard work as a, as an organization in a company, the size of Boeing, it has many layers, you know, at a local level and a regional level and an enterprise level, and they all have a connection. So, you know, we have that kind of a process as a company uh, already for whatever the case may be. And certainly for this situation, you know, we enacted that immediately and, Establish the the chain of communication necessary, and uh, so in we, other words, then you were able then to start making decisions right away. Exactly, yeah, exactly. So you know that was the, I think the immediate process we enacted our emergency response company process we have. Do you have you know, I, would add add there, I would just jump in there and add that you know that's part of our requirements as an automotive supplier. And we are audited as part of our certification to those mitigation plans. And with the recent uh, changes in IATF, the certification body that governs uh, the OEMs, um, you actually have to test that. So you have to induce tests to prove that you're prepared with these mitigation plans. So we're able to check off the box for pandemic, which is actually one of the mitigation plans that we had to have in place. So you can now check that off, by the way. Uh, but I would also add that, um, you know, it, it really takes, uh, if, if your company doesn't have one, you can go online and there's a number of companies that have shared those so you can get access to what these mitigation plans include and how they're framed out. And then you can, of course, adapt it to the, to the size and shape of your organization. So it's, it's worth doing because it forces you to think about, to think ahead, what would we do if? And it's a good exercise for a leadership team in any company to do. So I'd highly encourage people, the, the audience, if you haven't done that and you're not required to do that, uh, we're looking for it. Google it and, and get an example to, to run. Yeah, let me, if I could, I was going to say this at the end, but let me just take, since you mentioned that, uh, uh, Kirk, uh, at the TWI Institute, we also put together a, a COVID, a post-COVID advisory, uh, not a, not a not a mitigation plan, but things that you can do, you know, to get through the COVID, uh, you know, crisis and get back on your feet. And that advisory you can find uh, on. And what we did was we consolidated. We looked at many many of those things, like Kurt pointed out, that that are already out there, you know. And we tried to, you know, consolidate those things. In particular, of course, with the focus, you know, on how TWI can help you, just like Dave and Kirk are explaining. And you can find that on our website at TWI hyphen institute.com on the post COVID page. Okay. But uh, let's can, move on our discussion. Yeah, go ahead. Kirk. Can I just check one thing? Cause uh, I didn't really emphasize the human condition as much as I wanted to in my explanation, what was going on. So there are two major things we we're concerned about getting people back in the plant. Once we established essential being essential business. And that was who would want to come back in the plant, right? Because the fear was permeating. And then with the unemployment incentives, both at the state and federal level, people were making more money to stay at home, quite frankly. And so we're really concerned with how do we how do we make this an environment people want to come back to? And I'll never forget the second week into it, we, we had some people come back enough to to operate the 25 percent level. But the fear was so thick, you could cut it with a knife when you walked in the facility. And one of the things we did was just acknowledge it. And then the second thing we did is we, we brought in lunch for everybody every day. We gave gift cards out. We, we talked to people. And that made all of the difference in the world. And again, it was because the stage had already been set. We had good things, good foundational things in place. But that's what it took to kind of break that I don't know, that induced fear. And then we were able to get into a steady state and constantly recognize employees that would come into the plant, did sacrifice some extra pay uh, for and, and helped us out, quite frankly. So I just wanted to throw that in there because that was an important Thank element. You. Thank you. Did. Let me let me throw that back to Dave because Dave, we actually had a question. Uh, you kind of answered the question, uh, Kirk, but the question from one of the viewers was, how do you manage and mitigate fears of exposure you know, carrying the virus home. Dave, I noticed you nodding your head. Do you want to add anything to what you guys did Boeing as well on those lines? Yeah, I, you know, much like what Kirk was describing, you know, we worked very hard over this three-week shutdown period to create a work environment that was 
in our minds, as safe as we could make it. It, it. With, like I said, the goal really, when a person would come back and see what we've done with the workplace, we would want them to feel like this might be the safest place for me for the next eight hours. You know, how to, uh, that was what we were after. Um, along the way, though, you know, we made decisions around anyone that can do their work virtually must do so. So we had uh, a vast majority of our office workers become virtual. Uh, we didn't force anyone to do anything they were uncomfortable with. So if, if they had a family member at home that they felt was at risk, if they were coming to work, we accommodated that, you know, and uh, just tried to do everything we possibly could to demonstrate we care about our team and, and each individual person uh, one by one needs to be heard, you know. So we literally did that. And when we reopened three weeks later, uh, the people came back. We did have some that didn't, you know, that became, stayed home to kind of wait and see, I think a little like Kirk described. But when they did come back, they were really uh, amazed, I think, to some degree of what we'd done with the workplace while they were gone. You know, we had uh, temperature check stations, enhanced cleaning, work spaced out, uh, just a lot of things were put in place in that first three week period to where those that came back felt safe. And then of course, over time, more came back and more came back and you know, we adjusted as we went. And you know, much like any continuous improvement mindset, you know, the, the team thinks of better ways. We implement those right away. And it's just been this um, continuous improvement effort since then, you know, and advice is updated from, you know, government agencies and CDC, and we incorporate that immediately. Um, we just want to be very prompt, you know, with what we learn, what people say to us, that we respond quickly, we listen, and so forth. That has really been our day-by-day -day process. Hey, Dave, let me follow up with a question, another question that came from the audience, and uh, let, I'll just throw this one out at you. It says, how do you deal or if there were any any resentment? You mentioned a lot of people went home and were able to work home, but did you have to deal with any resentments that, uh, from production workers who maybe were envious or felt badly that they could not work remote, well, remotely like the office workers? Yeah, yeah. you know, we had that. Uh, we had that feedback, you know, and again, I think it's it's best in, in the best way to approach it is with a conversation, you know, so uh, what we talked about was, you know, there's some of us that have to be at work because you can't build an airplane remotely, obviously. So we have to be at work. Uh, but in order to keep us as safe as possible and, you know, only have the vital team in you know, the rest of our team can work virtual. Therefore, they will. That's fewer people on on our work sites then that would uh, reduce risk for everyone, you know, so we would have those types of conversations with our team. And, you know, you, you, I don't know, we just took this mentality that if someone felt unhappy or concerned or, you know, the, the, a lot of that frustration came or fear, anger, all of that stuff, we, we would just meet that with, a, okay, let's talk over, talk, let's talk this through a little bit. It wasn't a, um, like a compliance sort of mentality, you know, do it this way or else. You know, we really <laughs> had a um, let me understand how I can help you. What what is bothering you here? What can I do to help make this better? That would be the everyday, hour by hour, one by one conversations we were having with our teams. Yeah, you can really just if I say so myself, you can really see you know, your job relations skills working right. there, yep. you know, rather than just telling people this is the way it's going to be, you yeah. know, we're really working with people to understand their their emotions, their feelings, their opinions, and then finding a good solution that sure. everyone can agree with. Excellent. Okay. So, by the way, um, you know, I've been uh, working with, as you may know, I've been working with a lot of hospitals, and, you know, they're in the same situation. A lot of my uh, colleagues, you know, who work at hospitals, they can't get into the hospital either. So it's not just the factory, you know, non-essential, not direct healthcare workers. They're working remotely just as well. And there you are, you know, on the forefront, you know, of the COVID pandemic. So I think that's a situation that all industries, you know, you know are yeah. facing. 
But if we could move on, yeah, the next topic is we'd like to talk a little bit then. Now, you've kind of explained, you know, the, the broader visions of how you got uh, things uh, started. But maybe you could give us a few examples. Were there any challenges or, you know, things, uh, gotchas or things that you weren't expecting? Or, you know, we thought this would go one way, but it went another way that you had to overcome. Uh, maybe we'll turn it back to you, Kirk. Were there any anything, any kind of challenges you like to, stories you'd like to share with us on on kind of, you know, specific things that you had to overcome in order to get to your goals? Yeah, I think a lot of them did center around people. And as Dave was just explaining, you know, not because we didn't know and we didn't pretend like we did, that you, you had to be in this constant state of openness so that when you got the feedback that you reacted quickly and specifically about it. And then we fed that back through our video series and our app so that the rest of the group that was working from home and remotely could kind of get a sense for what's going on and that the leadership team was focused on taking care of our employees, taking care of our business, taking care of our customers and, and finding the best way possible to balance. But to answer your question, it's just those day by day things that popped up and, and mainly centered around how people felt about them and what our response was going to be without being able to say this is a concrete answer. It, it, it was more dynamic and fluid than that. And that was new territory for us all. And uh, I, I think Dave nailed it. When, when you show people that you're just as vulnerable and you're not going to provide an answer that you, you can't um, substantiate, then they got, it, it, it had a very positive effect. And then we all felt like we were in it together and figuring it out together. Um, so that was one side of it. The, the constant change of the production schedule, you know, that was, that was also a very difficult thing because um, trying to come up with a plan that you thought you had yesterday to only find out that today it was no longer a plan and then re-scrambling and then trying to assure people that um, together we'll make it through no matter what we have to do. And what we found at Marquardt on a couple of occasions is that that brought us closer together, in fact, because when you, when you keep your cool and everybody stays focused on the objectives and you support each other, then you become a stronger team. And that's for sure what has happened. Yeah, really, you know, what I'm hearing, uh, really just emphasizing some of those basic concepts that, you know, we emphasize with, with TWI or with Lean overall, getting people's involvement, listening to their ideas, uh, making sure that they're heard, good communication, you know, that seems to be that, found, you know, those, those mm -hmm. principles, you know, of good relationships, you know, that you find embedded in TWI really kind of served you well. JR was the absolute foundation of our communication pros, and it wasn't just internal. It was also externally with our customers. And uh, one of the things that came out of it was our customers um, asked us to work with other suppliers to basically help them understand how to do some of these things <laughs> coincidentally. And it was founded in, you know, good old fashioned JR fundamentals. So it was, it was fun to be recognized for that and be asked to do it. Uh, that also happened uh, for us because I mentioned automotive products. What I didn't mention is um, one third of our revenue globally comes from non-automotive products. And some of those products um, are standard switches that were used in the, um, um, the ventilators that Ford made. So we uh -huh. shipped oh, switches to Ford to support them ramping up to make the ventilators um, in their factories. And we yeah, also... Yeah, we also helped some of the local hospitals with our tool room to make adapters for some of their PPE that they couldn't get replacements for. So, again, that flexibility, that ability to pivot and to stay grounded in who we are and JR approaches and JI approaches was huge. Well, that sounds good. How about you, Dave? Were there any specific challenges or anything uh, that uh, you weren't expecting that you had to deal with and overcome? Yeah. You know, well, yeah. I, you know, I uh, as I was saying, you know, as we we emerged from our three week shutdown uh, and redesigned our work and you know, tried to achieve as much social distancing as we could. However, in certain cases, it's it's not really possible. So we we use a 
personal protective equipment, PPE solutions. And given the size of our company, you know, we quickly ran into logistics issues on that. And, you know, how do we find enough masks and not jeopardizing the, the medical requirements mm -hmm. or the healthcare requirements. And uh, so we became self-sufficient in many ways. We uh, had teams begin to sew masks at Boeing, you know, for our other team members. We uh, were 3D printing face shields for our own use, but also for the local uh, medical community. We were at one point, I think, 3D printing hundreds of face shield frames every day that we were donating uh, around the local areas that we operate in. Um, I think as the uh, as the guidance would change from the CDC, uh, we would try to react as fast as we could to that. And I think probably the maybe the biggest one was when um, in in Boeing at least we implemented June 15th. All of our sites in the U.S. we would wear masks at work, and you know I have mine right here. You know, so when I'm not in a closed room, which I'm in today at this moment in time, I have my mask on. Uh, it's uh, what we do, you know, we're getting used to it. Uh, we help each other with it. Uh, from a standard work perspective, we we did a job breakdown on how to apply and remove a mask properly. And we've uh, made that standard work instruction sheet. It's something we just literally hand out to everyone, you know. So uh, those types of transitions have been hard. Uh, they, they uh, you know, you probably read in the news about how controversial some of this stuff becomes, but we've yeah. been able to to deploy that in our company through using, like I mentioned, you know, these JR fundamentals about um, care and concern and so on. And and I'm happy to say it's gone well. You know, we, it's very rare occasion that we have someone come apart over having to wear a mask. You know, it do, it does happen, but when it does, you know, we just have a conversation about it and we. I explain why door. and yeah exactly so uh you know th those are the things that we've been just pivoting as necessary when things when we get better advice or a better way we pivot quickly and and uh improve what we're doing and and we've had a lot of success with that you know our our productivity is back to levels it was prior to the pandemic um the the, the number of people that are choosing to stay home because of fear diminishes every day uh, more and more people are coming to work. Uh, I think where we are right now is, you know, we're resizing our business based on where the airlines are. And that's just been right. another exploration, understanding you know, the airlines themselves, trying to understand what they should expect and feeding that back a lot like Kirk describes. You know, we've been through multiple iterations of what we think the demand's going to be over the next 18 to 24 months. And, you know, by the time we get that digested, there's another uh, scenario, okay, we think it's more like this, you know, so that's been, uh, we, we try to, we really try to um, keep our our teams, uh, you know, isolated from a lot of that churn and, and not put that burden on them, but, uh, mm -hmm. uh, you know, that has been tough to try to react to what we think our demand is going to be, and now, of course, our company is mm -hmm. going to shrink you probably seen it in the news, you know, we're shrinking our workforce just to right size our company right now, which is adding additional stress on top of what's going on. But it's really the same basic fundamentals around TWI that help us navigate all of these conditions. So, yeah, it's a tough situation for everybody. Well, thank you guys. Well, as we kind of come towards the, as we get into the closing minutes of our hours, uh, the final question uh, for you, gentlemen, is, you know, so. Uh, and you've kind of already stepped into that, but uh, Dave, as you're mentioning, you know, how are things going now? You're resizing, uh, you know, people have, have reacted, but, you know, could you maybe talk a little bit about some of the lessons that you've learned or, or maybe what are your experiences, you know, as we go forward? You know, obviously the, um, the pandemic is not going away as we see, um, you know, what's your situation now as you look forward now uh, going forward? Why don't we turn it over to Kurt since Dave was just talking? Yeah, so as you said, I started to touch on that. Um, we've, we've ramped back up based on theoretical demand. Um, the good news is most of our products are in SUVs and trucks, and those have been selling. There was a number of incentives out there um, from the OEMs 
and their their inventory, their dealer days on hand was at an all time low, and they pulled back some of those incentives. So those are indicators to us that we might actually see a resurgence and back to some kinds of closer to plan numbers. Um, but a lot of lessons were learned. We're we're still operating under the um, nobody comes back into the office unless they're essential or they need to be in the office. So we plan on uh, for the foreseeable future, having people work from home. Uh, we have production ramping back up, but we've also figured out how to right size and uh, be more productive. Our productivity actually went up. And so we we took the time to implement a number of simple lean methods. And so we want to continue that on. So there's a number of things that we learned throughout this process that, as I said earlier, made us stronger and that we plan on leveraging and going forward. So it will not look like it has in the past as we move forward, no matter what the production volumes are, no matter what happens going forward. So we, we plan on being a different company and we because we already are. And I would add here that we're now exploring what it's like to uh, long-term work from home and how do you protect the teamwork, the camaraderie. I, knew, I know so that was some of the questions. So we're exploring that now. We don't have all the answers there, but we've been working on things like the way we touch base with our employees through their managers, uh, group sessions, all kinds of things on a weekly and monthly basis to make sure that we stay connected as a team. And everybody's getting used to those kinds of things and it sure isn't the same as the energy you feel when you're in a room with a group of people. You can't substitute that, uh, but we are finding ways and people um, are accepting that and uh, some are actually enjoying it. So <laughs> that's, a, that's a big part of, I would say even more than the production side, that's a big part of our new strategy to move forward, how to work remotely in the most productive fashion possible and still maintaining a team environment and camaraderie we enjoy uh, in the office. Yeah, let me let me throw that same question because that was a question uh, you answered it, Kirk. Uh, we had a question from the audience come in and say, "What are what are you doing to foster those employee relationships for those people who are working remotely because they don't have that you know that interaction?" Um, Kirk mentioned that. Dave, do you have anything that you're doing there at Boeing for with the, all the people that are working remotely, how do you maintain relationships when people are at home, working from home? Yeah, I mean, it's, I think it's, uh, it's, it presents a challenge, a new challenge for us. Uh, I think it's so an old fashioned way and that's just reaching out individually. If you're a manager and you have a team of employees now that are virtual, uh, you just need to take steps where you could normally walk around and say hello to everyone and kind of check on them every day. Uh, you still do that. You know, you just do it in a different way. You do it by phone call or you do it by instant message or yeah, all those things. And, and, and it does, it does work. You know, it's, it's just different and it takes some, I think, getting used to, but you know, I'm finding that with my own team and, uh, we're finding that around the company. I, I think Boeing, you could say, is has been a bit of an old-fashioned company, you know, as far as working virtually and so on. You know, just not so much a thing we had done in Boeing. But coming out of this, it is, we are going to be a different company coming out of this, and there will be uh, more flexibility for people. I believe, you know, we won't. I think we can expect that there will be cases where people can work virtual some days a week and on site some days a week. And, you know, that'll be more of a, of a, uh, a normal, more flexible way to accomplish work. And we've, we kind of were pushed into it with this and, and have demonstrated that it, it, we can do it and we can and do it well. But uh, I don't think there's any substitute from personal engagement with your team uh, yeah. through whatever means you have available uh, at the time. And that's just how we've done that. And, you know, we here at the TWI Institute as well, we've learned a lot. You know, I myself have been, you know, busy over the last many six to eight weeks plus learning how to do things virtually because all of our yeah. clients are calling in saying, hey, how do we do, we, we need TWI training, but how do we do it? We can't go to the office. Uh, people can't come into work. Can we do this virtually? And 
you know, eight weeks ago, I would have said I was the first one. I'm an old fashioned like you guys, Dave. I was like, no, no, PWI is face to face. You know, it's on, at the Gimba. It's on the job. And, you know, we uh, people said, hey, they, they said to me, we, we're not going to go back. You got to figure this out. And we struggled and we did experiments. And in fact, before I got on this web conference, I was teaching my first beta test uh, JI class four locations, one in Minneapolis, three in Mexico, you know, and we're all on there practicing JI and it's, uh, wow. you know, we have some audio issues and some language issues, but, you know, uh, you know, we, we just figure it out. And uh, of course, I don't think it is as good or it replaces face-to-face -face training, but, you know, when, when, when the situation forces you, you know, into that uh, position, you, you got to kind of try and figure it out and kind of create that, create that new normal. And then, and I think what we've all found out is that, um, you know, uh, we can make, we can use the technology, we can maintain good training, good relationships, all the things that we've been talking about here this afternoon, you know, through these, uh, through these technologies, kind of like we're doing right now with our audience. Um, anything else, though, Dave, in terms of lessons learned, you, you want to add as we wrap up here? Yeah, I, you know, I think it's, uh, I don't know, over my course of my, I've been 35 years in Boeing, and I, and I just now, I think generally understood the importance of building relationships with people and how that uh, really uh, helps us with better business results. And then, of course, you know, several years ago, Pat, when I got to meet you and really understood TWI, uh, I, I think it's the single most important thing in my mind that's prepared me to be able to function and, and perform and take care of my team and so on more than anything else I've ever really encountered in my work life you know so for those on the call if you're you know if you're looking for some basic skill-based way of handling the vast majority of problems we encounter in our work life this is in my mind the right way to go and uh, it's it's just served me so well and uh, you know in a crisis situation you know you need something a beacon or something you can grab onto and and that's what this has done for me so, so. Pat, we can't hear you. I don't know if you accidentally were muted or. Fortunately, it's happening at uh, three minutes to go. And yeah, yeah, yeah. Can you hear me now? We yeah, can. we can hear it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I may have just bumped my 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 mic uh, button. But you know, we started out this conversation saying that uh, you know, in World War II, we had a crisis, and we had a, we needed a solution and that was TWI. And so it was created in that crisis mentality and we're seeing the benefits now as we get into this pandemic crisis and how well, you know, these skills have served us and we owe a great debt of gratitude, you know, to our TWI founders who were back there in Seattle building the B-17 back in the day. And here we are today, you know, continuing to use um, those, uh, those uh, methods. And, you know, as I said, at the TWI Institute, you know, we're working hard as well. You know, I mentioned about the post-COVID advisory. Uh, you can look at that. It's a four-page PDF, which gives you just lots of good information on how TWI can be used, you know, as you rebuild uh, through the pandemic. You know, I've also made lots of videos uh, that you can find on our website, you know, in terms of hand hygiene and um, tabletop cleaning, how to put on a mask, you know, how to put on gloves, just some basic things like that, which actually you know, we worked on with our nurse trainers, you know, so that really is that come, you know, we're working with nurses and hospitals and now working with manufacturers. And now we've got this blend of, you know, where those skills that we got from our nurse trainers of TWI have really been applied to, you know, uh, uh, last week, uh, someone emailed me uh, from Wisconsin and said, hey, Pat, I was showing your hand hygiene, you know, video last night on the night shift, you know, <laughs> teaching everybody how to make sure they wash their hands. And then those kinds of things then help our workers then to, as, as Dave and Kirk explained, you know, when we do this properly, our workers can feel safe, they can feel secure, they can feel heard uh, and uh, more comfortable as they, as they come back into work and, and come back um, onto, the, onto the job. So um, with that, unless uh, Kirk, Dave, uh, unless you have any final comments, I'd like to thank you very much for the time and sharing with us your great sure. um, experiences and uh, really appreciate the time. And I hope that our audience uh, has gotten a lot out of this. And uh, certainly, 
uh, we couldn't have heard it from two uh, uh, better people who were right out there on the front lines you know, of the pandemic when it hit. So with that, uh, I'll say thank you to our audience and turn it back to Dwayne. Hey, thank you so much, gentlemen. Um, you know, when, when this pandemic uh, first hit us, I had no doubt that the lean, the improvement, the TWI communities would face this adversity well. And just a couple of things I heard here in the end, uh, uh, one of you said, uh, yes, it presented us with a new challenge. Um, it wasn't a problem, it was a challenge to be figured out, to be conquered. And uh, some uh, Patrick, I think you just said, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll figure it out. Um, that's the spirit that really, I appreciate in hearing you guys share that spirit. And, and I know that those watching uh, share that with you. So. Thank you so much, Patrick, Dave, and Kirk for, for being a part of this. And remember, you can hear uh, from Patrick Graup directly uh, as he delivers a, a keynote speech uh, July 27th as part of the Virtual Lean Coaching Summit. Uh, you can learn more by visiting leanfrontiers.com slash summits. And as mentioned earlier, you'll receive an email shortly after we're done with a link to the recording. Please do share this with others in your organization. There's also some links in there like to the coaching summit, but we also have links to the TWI Institute website where you can learn more about the Institute as well as some of the videos and resources that, that Patrick mentioned. So thank you so much, uh, gentlemen, really appreciate your time. And to everyone who participated in today's session, have a great day and now go do good things. Bye everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.